Hello everyone, my name is Richard Simcott and I'm here to talk to you today about when we can say we can speak a language. So when can I say I speak a language? I've always found this a very interesting topic and something that comes up again and again. So during this talk, what I want to do is talk about why this topic, why am I talking about this? Some of our community thoughts in the language learning community, we have a lot of them. Some of the common perceptions of what it means to speak a language, some common themes, things that are discussed around that topic, and then my conclusions, and then some time for some questions and answers from you as well, of course. So for me, this journey begins a long, long time ago in 2006 with language forums online. And I like to think of this as the time of the online villains and heroes. So at that time, I was taking part in a lot of language forums. There was no YouTube, really. There was a little bit of YouTube. It wasn't very big as it is now. There was no Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And all of the communities that we know and love right now just weren't there. They were just language forums. And the king of those online forums, for me, and for many other people out there, was this man, Alexander Oguales. He was the authority on everything language, everything polyglot. He was the person that we'd go to to ask our questions about where languages are from, how difficult they are, how to learn them, how much we needed to know to be able to speak them. He made videos on methods of language learning. He had a YouTube channel as well, showing, demonstrating how he went through the process of learning languages, talked about the methods and books that he liked to use. And he also answered questions from people, many people like me, um, about languages and language learning. And we all gravitated towards him. On the forums, there was a subsection about polyglots. And I think this is probably where everything sort of that we're here today was born out of because it came out of this polyglot community that we talked about, this almost obsession with speaking one more language and another language and another language and so the question started coming in well who does this why why do they do it and what what do they get out of it and there were kind of unicorns that we talked about that we didn't really get to meet people like Johan van der Wolle, who won the polyglot competition of europe uh, many many years ago many decades ago and many people don't even know about this competition nowadays but he was kind of one of these unicorns that you never really saw or you didn't hear from, but he'd mastered all of these languages and it was just fascinating to hear about him. And I know for me, he was a personal hero. I mean, he was somebody who was, you could imagine meeting, right? Not, not like a Mezzofanti that had died hundreds of years ago and you couldn't really contact them to verify whether or not they actually learned all of these languages. But he was an actual real life person. And you knew that he was a university professor. You knew he'd been through the process over a long period of time, a bit like Professor Alexander Aguelas. And then there was Daniel Tammet. And Daniel Tammet sprung onto our screens. He was the forefront of the person who would master a language, in this case, Icelandic, within a week. He went over to Iceland with, I believe it was the BBC, and he made a, a documentary, who took part in a documentary about people with incredible abilities. And this ability that he has, he has it with numbers, but he also has this ability to learn languages quickly. And he went to Iceland and he went to the University of Iceland and I met his teacher uh, a few years later. And I understood that actually he was only there for four days. And then he went on TV in Iceland, national television, and did an interview in Icelandic. And of course, the internet was like, how is this possible? How many words does he actually know? What does he know? How much does he actually speak it? Can he really say he speaks it? And this is kind of the point that I remember, that the discussion about how do you say that you speak a language? When do you say that you speak a language? Really sort of was in full swing. And I always found it a really interesting thing. Did this guy really speak this language? And, you know, from what I heard, people in Iceland felt happy to say that he spoke it. And so it left, the, it left many more questions unanswered than it actually answered for me and for many other people in the polyglot or language learning community. 
There were other people that we know today, like Michael Campbell, and we know him for his his business, Glossica, and he was called Glossica on the forums that we had years and years ago. And Glossica had a list of languages. Many of you have lists of languages now on this forum for um, for the Polyglot Gathering online with your, your sort of digital badges of which languages you speak and to which levels. And he had a list of languages that was huge and he almost became a mythical figure himself of all these languages that he'd studied and, and learned and could speak. And no one really knew how much to what degree, but it was kind of a subject of debate and, and, and talk. And people were just enthralled with, how do you do this with all of these languages? And do you really speak a language? When do you speak them? The game always came back to that question of when do you speak a language? Steve Kaufman was around at that time as well. And of course, we know him from his videos and we know him from Link and we know him from all you know his, his wonderful talks. And he's got a lot to say on these topics. And at that time too, he was kind of out of the community that I'd just come into uh, with the how to learn any language for him. But you could hear him with his thoughts and ideas and opinions in other areas. So mainly it was starting on YouTube at that point. And of course, Steve himself um, speaks a number of languages. But then we started seeing other things happening online. So the forums were one thing, but when YouTube videos, polyglot videos on YouTube came into play, we noticed something different happened. There was a real swing. There were people coming out and making videos, speaking a gazillion languages, like lots and lots of languages. So I myself made a video speaking 16 of the languages I've studied. And of course, they were all to different levels. And you can hear that in the video. And that's how it was intended. But the real trailblazer for doing this, the first person that I know who actually did this was Stu J. Raj. And he made a video in several languages talking about and in his languages, what he'd done. He'd been on TV in Thailand using his languages. He was clearly very, very good at a number of them. And he couldn't help but inspire and amaze people with his abilities. And I know that Luca uh, and I both followed in his footsteps. Luca before me and then I was probably the third person, I believe, that made a video on YouTube speaking many, many languages. And of course I watched Stu J and I also watched Luca and we reached out to each other as well. And we, we became friends. So Luca even came to my house and we carried on this conversation in person. And as this became a thing that we started talking about in person, it made sense that in 2013 that we'd have a polyglot conference. We started talking about that in 2012 and a few of us that have already met offline. And then it was a chance for a lot of these big figures, these big characters to come together. And once and for all, we decide when you can speak the language, right? So we had Anthony Lauder come up and he was always very big on saying that he didn't speak any language except English. And I knew he'd studied lots of languages because I met up with him in, in Prague and I, I'd spoken to him online. So I knew that it wasn't true that he only spoke English, but he always said, you know, the only language I always speak is English. That's the only one I'll say I speak. Um, but he always said, you know, he was a polyglot instead of a polyglot, which everyone thought was hilarious, me included. And he was asking the question, when you become a polyglot? Well, you learn a language and then you just add one more and then another one and then another one until you become a polyglot. And that's it. But that still didn't answer my question of when do you say you speak a language? Because he was still saying he didn't speak anything except English. Then on the other side of the coin, we had Benny Lewis, who was talking at the first Polyglot conference about how to go viral. Now, he was known for his fluent in three months. He was known for speaking from day one. He was known for language hacks. He was known for this intensive and immersive language learning approach. So he would go somewhere, he would start speaking a language, he'd interact with the natives, he'd interact with other people, and he'd be going great guns from day one. So for Benny, it sounded like you were speaking a language straight away didn't seem that everyone agreed. I mean, Luca was shared his story. And Luca, very much to my mind, in uh, when, when I first heard about Luca, he was speaking a number of languages to a very high level with a very, uh, a very close to native accent in them as well. And 
he very much seemed to concentrate on this, working on accents and pronunciation, sounding native like reading books. He was at that time working towards passing C2 exams in languages. And for those of you who are not aware, the C2 exam is the highest level of exam that you can pass in a language. And that's really speaking a language, but with with a lot of uh, awareness and ability to manipulate the language in many, many aspects. But was that the place where you say you speak a language? And I didn't know myself, to be honest. I, I, I never knew when you'd feel comfortable saying it. And Lucas certainly felt shy about speaking languages before he felt he'd got to these kinds of really upper echelons of the language learning journey. And then Alex Rawlings came. Now, Alex, had come from a very different background. He was studying Russian and Oxford at the time, uh, Russian and German at the time at Oxford University. So he'd been through some really rigorous courses and he knew what it meant to really get deep into some of the literature, some of the grammatical aspects of the languages and to be really taken out of his comfort zone and put in uh, situations that made language learning quite uncomfortable because you had to do things that weren't easy uh, often and um, things that you didn't necessarily look to do to be able to get about your daily go about your daily routine and so Alex had a very fresh perspective because he'd also done that and he'd been learning a number of languages on his own with great uh, results and um, to the fact to the point that he became the most multilingual student in the UK and that was after a competition run by HarperCollins. And um, so having these different people on stage really showed different aspects of what it was like to speak different languages, but it still didn't get to the point of what it meant to speak different languages. And then for me, one of the standout people at the whole event was Judith Meyer. Judith Meyer, first thing you're gonna possibly notice is She's the first woman I've spoken about uh, the, the whole, from this presentation from the beginning. Judith Meyer was involved in all of the forums. She had made some videos as well. But Judith Meyer amazed me because she didn't come to the Polyglot Conference to talk about language learning per se or how many languages she spoke or you know how well she'd done with the languages. No, no, not at all, none of it. Judith came and she gave a, a talk about computing, computational linguistics. And she did it in English, and not, which isn't even a native language. She did it in English. Her native language German, is German. And then she speaks a number of other languages too. And something about Judith really just uh, stood out to me because of exactly what she did at the conference. Not how she behaved, not all of the things she said, but how she presented herself, particularly during her talk. Now, when we went back offline, I thought that, okay, we're back online, we're gonna be talking again, and we're, we've, we've now resolved the whole issue and question about how many languages we've got. But absolutely not. I think from that point onwards, we really got more energy and more enthusiasm to learn more and more languages. And it seemed like we were adding languages. We went to that polynot uh, discussion of, let's add one, the add one challenge started. And Brian Kwong, who came to the event, also started with that. And that now continues all of these language learning challenges. Let's add one, add one, add one, add one. So we get to what, 186 languages? How many do we speak? How many do we carry on for? And the, con the conversation, instead of feeling that we'd unified and agreed on a, on a sort of an idea of what it meant to speak a language and when we could say we spoke a language, actually just seemed to carry on and go from strength to strength as to the divergence of what that actually meant. There seemed to also be a kind of a bragging right uh, as well. So I speak like a gazillion languages and there were people that were coming out saying that they spoke this and that and the other and people were arguing and discussing and disputing and no one was really clear or sure what it meant to speak a language anymore. It seemed that we had people from who were inspired by Tim's story, Tim Dona, who, who was a, a great 16 year old in New York at the time. He was learning all of these great languages, doing wonderful things. Moses McCormick, again, studying lots and lots of different languages, going out and using what he knew to speak to people, to communicate, to surprise people. And he does that to this day. And all of these things, people were sometimes calling bragging, sometimes they were saying it's great because they're going into lots of languages and they're exploring things. And, I'll get to that point of what I think about all of this at the end. 
But I thought it was really interesting that this is how the, the dialogue, the rhetoric, the, 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 it all developed in this way. So I thought to myself, well, if I keep seeing this question over and over again, what do I do? Well, we have social media and everyone on social media has an opinion, right? So let's go to social media and ask the question. So I took my question for this talk to social media and to my particular social media channels. When can I say I speak a language? So I went to uh, the people who follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and I asked them this very question. In fact, I posted that very picture and I got a lot of responses. So people came back and they all had something to say. From this as the very first one of, if you can say hello in the language, you're speaking it. What do we think? Can you speak it if you just say hello? Um, it's a very short conversation, but that wasn't the end of it. We had a number of other different and varied responses. Clearly, when we talk about how much study is required for speaking a language, people often refer to this. This is the framework that people often talk about, the A1, A2, which is kind of like a beginner level, B1, B2, which is kind of an intermediate level, C1, C2, which is very advanced. It's not clearly or accurate to say, actually, beginners, intermediate and advanced, and to sort of draw the line there. It feels like an, a disservice to the, the scale. But just to be very sort of, give an overview i'm going to i'm going to put them into this these categories for now people often answered with questions with with answers like for me it's usually when i hit b2 okay that's uh, it's, it's good there's definitely a description of what b2 means um it's it's, it's an interesting perspective to take these scales and to apply them to, to answer the question, when do I speak a language? Steve Kaufman, actually, I hope Steve doesn't mind me um, just saying that he was the one who gave me the second one, which I quite enjoyed reading, actually, um, of, you know, saying that you're A1, saying you speak a language. No, you don't speak a language, according to Steve. Um, A2, you speak it you speak it better than you can understand. And at B1, you can understand better than you speak. B2, yes, you speak the language. C1, C2, yes, I speak it quite well, actually. That's Steve Kaufman's um, appraisal of it. I actually really liked the way he broke it down in that way. I thought it was really useful. And then we got level B1 or so. Ah, fair enough. We've got some differences of opinions there of these different levels and how they can be used to say you speak a language. Then we also had things that were very easy to do. So when you can speak, you can when you can say you speak, then that's enough. Cogito ergo sum. So I say I speak it, I speak it. Okay. Um, if you're hungry and you go into a, a, a shop and you come out with the food that you want to eat, then you can speak it. What about if you look at a child and a child's learning its first language? Well, the child's babbling at first, but you'd say, would you say they're a speaker of that language? Are they speaking the language? And then that person then thought that if you can do that with a the child, then you can say that about somebody babbling around or babbling in, in, in a foreign language, that they then speak that language. When natives say that you speak the language very well, then I can say I speak with great fluency. That's what somebody wrote as well. Very, very differing opinions um, from the first lot with the, um, with, with the levels, but this is the very easy. Then we get to a slightly more complicated. So things that you can talk about different topics, even if you make mistakes. You can, you can sort of get around somewhat, but you're not 100% perfect. And you make yourself understood to the person uh, before they leave the room. And you can hold a conversation with a taxi driver. So these sound like quite simple conversations that you could potentially have and say that you speak. Other people say it's a little bit more difficult. What about when you can have a job interview and get the job? Or when you can use the language to the same degree as a 10 year old native speaker? Then it gets very difficult with some people. Some people are very uh, demanding on what it means to speak a language. They think that if you can explain nuclear magnetic resonance, then you can speak a language. That sounds very complicated to me. Um, or if you know roughly 20,000 to 30,000 words, that sounds like a big job as well. And um, being able to express every day, every idea whatsoever, so everything at all, 
Then we get to the never. So somebody told me that actually they don't think they can speak even their native tongue. They don't speak any languages. They're just familiar with languages. Is that true? Is that fair to say that you're just familiar with a language, that you don't speak any language, you're just familiar with them? And then we get people asking about percentages, talking about percentages. Of what percentage of a language, do you, if you understand 80% and then you speak with 20% of your, of your languages with mistakes, or if you know at least 70% of the language, then you speak it. Um, if you understand 70% of the message conveyed, then actually you say you can't speak it. So there are people that are saying almost the opposite in terms of percentages, whether they can speak it or not. And then some people are just saying, well, it's just too difficult to even say. So it's a tough one to pinpoint. Um, it's a continuum. It's not a yes or no thing. It's just an opinion. It's what you think at the time. So this wasn't really helping me at all. <laughs> I even had somebody change their mind. They said that they had a degree in linguistics. They had a CSA2 certificate in Romanian. And then at that point, they said they didn't even think they could speak a language. But now they've had a kind of a change of heart. And they say, if I can conduct myself in daily life in the target country without using my native language, then I speak the language. It's a big turnaround in opinion, right? As you can see, opinions differ. And what I would say is, it's always good to not try and please everyone all of the time because you end up pleasing no one at all. Opinions are as different as the designs of this frosting or snowflakes. Everyone's got very different opinions on this topic. The game changer for me was meeting different people. People like Lydia Makova, who had reached really great levels in a number of languages. She was just out there doing it. She wasn't really focused on the, I speak this many languages, I do this. The bragging rights and kind of things all sort of disappeared. And it was just sort of, this is what I do and this is how I do it and I can help you do it. People like Ernestine Lyons, who came and spoke at the Polyglot Conference in Ljubljana. She came from a, a tough background in Detroit and she taught herself a number, of, a number of languages. And it was about the process, it was about doing it. It's people like Anya Spilka, who learn languages and use them on a daily basis and just do it effortlessly and without any questions of, do I really speak it or not, just does it. It's people like Lindy Bortas, who put things out there on, on social media and reach out to people and touch and so many people around the world with, her journey, her language learning. It's people like Ariel Corrin who came and spoke and use so many languages to such a high level, but they didn't just do that for this. She actually goes out there and, and uses her languages for good on doing crisis translations and getting people involved on a voluntary basis to help people use languages, use our languages for good and not question, do we speak them, do we not speak them? It's to use them for something good, to help communities, to help individuals. It's people like Maureen Millwood who study all of the sort of minority languages. They get in there, they just get involved and do trying to do positive things and encourage other people. And these people to me, are they've taken the whole situation of where we are with, do I speak a language? And for me, they've made it irrelevant. They've taken what seemed to be an important topic and made it a non-topic for me. So this is why, and you'll notice that I started this with a bunch of men at the beginning, with the one exception of Judith Meyer. And I ended it with a group of women. And I can add to that absolutely without end. Um, the amount of women who, enter this dialogue, enter this community, enter this question. And they do it and they take it from a very different angle and a very different perspective. And I would say they, they just balance out the whole question. And this is why I'm glad of the diversity in our community because it shows that sometimes what we think is important is not important. And Teaming up with someone like Anya now for the Polyglot Conference, 
is an honor for exactly that reason, because it gives me the ability to level and balance things out as well. So this is how I balance things out. And these are my thoughts. The steps to fluency, just when you think you're fluent and there's no more to learn, you turn a corner and you spot another set of stairs leading you up a mountain. And that is when you realize that, yes, you may speak the language, but there's a lot, a long way to go. There always is a long way to go. Even if you reach native like level in a language, there's always more. There's always a new path, a new adventure, new steps. How long does it take? It takes as long as you've got. It takes as long as your life on this earth. It takes as long as you want to dedicate to it. There is no end to learning to speak a language. Language speaking, fluency, whatever you want to call it, for me is kind of captured in this image of the sand and the sea. You walk on the sand and it's firm. It's firm because you know what you're learning, you know what you're doing. You're learning set words, set phrases, set parts of grammar, and you're learning them so that you can swim one day in the waters of that language, in the waters of that culture, in the waters of the people who use the language on a daily basis. And as you walk towards the edge of the water, the water starts to go over your feet, over your toes caress your toes. Your toes start to go down into the sand and you realize that actually it's a bit more difficult to walk right now because you're starting to communicate the people of the water. You start to communicate with the people. You start to use the language in a fluid way. Every now and again, a wave will come up onto the beach and it will sweep you down and you can almost swim. You almost feel like you speak the language and maybe you are speaking the language. Maybe you are swimming. But then all of a sudden the tide goes out quite quickly and you're back on the sand and you're huh, like a deer in the headlights. I don't speak the language anymore. These are the feelings we have when we learn a language because we feel we speak it, then we don't, then we do, then we don't. And as we start walking on the sand, the sand gets softer. The water becomes the more important thing and it starts to carry us out on the tide and into the water, into the deeper parts of the water. And we look and we think we see a line where the water and the sand meet. But then we realize actually there's just a gradient and the sand is getting lower and lower and the water is getting deeper and deeper. And what we realize is that actually we start swimming, we start speaking. Every now and again, our feet still touch the sand at the bottom. Every now and again, we're unsure. Every now and again, we get swept back onto the sand. But that's what speaking is. So what I say to you is, the road is long, so enjoy the view on the way. Thank you very much for joining me for this presentation. I hope that you can identify with some of the things I said, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, I'm gonna see, okay. I have a lot of questions here. Uh, let me see if I can just make this screen a little bit bigger because I'm struggling to, to view them, unfortunately. Just a second. Okay. Richard, how many languages would you consider yourself fluent in and which ones? So I never answer this question. And the reason I don't answer this question is I think that it's up to the speaker, um, the speaker of the other language so the listener to decide whether or not I speak it and whether or not I speak it fluently. If they decide I speak it fluently, I speak it fluently. If they decide I don't speak it fluently, another day or another speaker, I don't speak it fluently. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that I try and swim. And sometimes if I'm not swimming properly and I have to touch the bottom with my feet, that's fine too. What Slavic languages do you speak? Which one do you like most? So I have studied uh, most of the Slavic languages in the group. I was, uh, so my, my home language is Macedonian. So that's the one I speak best. Um, and I speak it on a daily basis because it's my home language with my wife. Um, I also have studied um, and speak to varying degrees, of course, um, Czech, Polish, Russian, uh, Slovene, 
um, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, uh, and Bulgarian. And uh, and there we go. <laughs> I think that's it. And um, if you don't uh, maintain a language, how do you, how easy uh, is it for you to lose it and uh, and then regain it? Okay, so that actually happens um, all the time. I do language projects very often when I know that I'm not going to need a language for my work or my private life. I will often learn a language just to a level to be able to go as a tourist or to do something very specific. And so I don't put any pressure on myself to speak a language as we would describe as, you know, very high level of fluency on all topics. So I did this with Indonesian three years ago. I went to Indonesia. I spoke the language and communicated with the locals, um, did the things I needed to do around town. And then three years later, back in the Balkans and I never used it. So it kind of went. And um, just about a month ago, I decided that I would start looking at Indonesian again because I was at home, I had a lot more time on my hands with the COVID-19 pandemic and um, I started taking lessons and within a couple of lessons I found a lot of the vocabulary and the grammar coming back and I could start communicating what was going on in my daily life in Indonesian. So yeah, fairly quickly. Um, it depends on the language as well, of course. How do you ac uh, accurately present, uh, present language skills and fluency? Um, resume standard exams um, versus your spoken. How do I accurately present language as skills? Okay. Um, it's, look, I mean, I think that the CEFR language uh, scale is pretty good. Um, it's often misused. It, people often think that they're going to um, hide themselves away for a week to be one. It's just not the okay, case, unfortunately. Uh, I, I actually have done um, the CEFR levels for Turkish. I did uh, Turkish A1, A2, and B1. I did the whole courses and passed the exams in all three. And um, it took me uh, three months of intensive study to do A1. Um, so we went through a book and it took three weeks, three months of 16 hours a week of lessons, then 20 hours a week of additional lessons to get to A1 in Turkish. Same for A2 and then double that for B1. So you're talking a year of very intensive study for me to get to B1. And, um, and I would say at that point, I, I was able to do a fair amount of things. Um, and I, I, I did the exam. So I would use those as a good um, a good measuring stick for, for languages. It's very difficult to, to, to say exactly because clearly the pass mark for an exam, if you pass and you get 60% and you get 90%, there is still a difference again within the levels, right? So, um, so it's very, very difficult to quantify. And I think that's why I tend to leave it to the person listening to me to decide whether or not I speak their language and how well. So what do you think about polyglots who care more about the um, the amount of languages they speak than the joy of learning? I don't know. I, I, I can't second guess people's um, people's reasons for learning, why they do it. I know that there are people who dip into languages more and just sort of look at lots of language families. And I would say that there's a lot of fun in doing that because you get to experience or get an overview of a language quite nicely and quite quickly. Um, so I can see why, why that would appeal to people. Um, I, I can't say for certain whether or not they do that just to add numbers. Um, I think it, it feels like that would be a shallow reason to do it, to just add numbers. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't really know of anybody who would do it for that reason. I think that, um, or at least they haven't said that to me anyway. Um, so I, I, I think that generally, um, the, any reason why you're learning languages, whether it's because you want to get to a C2 level or you want to get to um, a B2 level or an A1 level in a number of languages, um, I think that they're all worthwhile endeavors because they give you um, an insight into another culture, even if it's only a superficial one. Um, or if, the, for example, similar languages, like I studied Slovak for two weeks uh, before the polyglot gathering in Bratislava a few years ago, and I, I, I didn't have any intentions of learning it really, really well. Uh, just to just to sort of see the differences between Slovak and Czech really for me was the important thing. But by the end of the two weeks, I could then understand Slovak a lot better. And um, and of course, because it was a related language, I was able to converse quite quite nicely in Slovak. It all went back away again because um, 
I, I my, 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 one of my main languages in the Slavic group was Czech because I studied it at university. Um, do you have any special memory techniques or other special, um, especially method in which you, okay. So um, anything I would recommend? Well, I would say that um, for me, it's, it's doing things regularly. It's actually studying the language that works. Um, so I always say at least two active study sessions a week, separate them as much as you can. Uh, find a course that works for you, uh, whether that's uh, Asimil, Teach Yourself, um, or anything else that you, that you feel works. Could be a locally sourced uh, set of materials. Could be anything really that, you, that works. I'd say use that and do active studies at least twice a week um, and then in between lessons, also review what you've done. So actually set time, make sure you set time to do it. So that's the, there, there, there's no real pill, there's no magic pill or anything that I can, I can give or prescribe to, to say that you have to do this. It's, it definitely needs to be something that you, you do because um, you want to do it, you know your motivation, it's clear, you've, you've set yourself some specific goals and you've also set yourself time in your calendar when you're going to study. And I'd say, that for me is uh, the important thing and i'd say that uh, in terms of memory techniques i tend to um, try and think of languages that i already know or words that i know if i'm finding it difficult to remember a word for whatever reason then i try and link it to things so that it, it sticks in my memory um, these are memory palace type techniques um, where you create a story almost around a word uh, it could be to do with sounds it could be to do with the etymology it could be to do with a number of things but it just helps to make the memory more vivid and i'd say yeah go for go for something like that um, what languages do you know? Uh, not sure if you speak. Okay. What language do you know where you're not sure if you speak it or not? Um, I Now, just the essence of that question for me, I, I, I believe I don't know. If I don't know, I don't know. Um, I, some, sometimes it's really weird. Like I, I find that certain cultures are not used to people speaking a language. So, for example, the, the, the common one is Chinese. So people will say, Ni hao, and they'll say, oh, and you, you speak Chinese really, really well, and you just said hello. Um, so you get this sort of, you almost have to measure yourself. And this is why I think that, as I say, I noticed that um, the more women who sort of started having a voice in the language learning community, the, the, the more balanced things became, because they tended to be a, a lot more um, reason sort of they uh, <laughs> kind of more of a, a rhyme and reason to what they were saying I think I think it, it, you kind of I think it's unfortunately it's a it, it's a male characteristic as well very often not always but some very often to kind of to almost push yourself so far forward and become very competitive whereas um, I, I like and I've, I've learned a lot from um, the great female voices in our community for this exact reason. I try to calm it down and say, okay, look, um, this is me saying some things. So uh, I will try always and, and sort of downplay more than upplay uh, things that I can do. Um, so do you think society pushes us on our certificate instead of um, thinking about the quality of the language we study? Absolutely. I think that sometimes the certificate does sometimes become the more important thing and not the ability to actually use the, the language or the knowledge. And that's not just for languages, that's for many, many things. Um, you see this at school in the UK where I grew up, where people will pass their GCSE, which is their end of school uh, certificate in um, in French or German or Spanish, or which, whichever language they choose, and um, they can't actually string a sentence together. And this happens in many, many countries, and it's because they, they go after set phrases, you learn certain things to pass an exam, to say the right things at the right time, and then you move on and you just leave it and forget it. And they treat it almost like it's any other subject that you don't really need. Um, you just need to be able to say the right things at the right time to get the right mark. Unfortunately, that is the way it is. Um, I, I, I hope that people get more benefit and enjoyment out of learning languages. And I'm sure that obviously in this community we do, because otherwise we wouldn't be at this event, right? <laughs> Um, so this is a more important imposter syndrome uh it's the language enthusiasts um, ooh, um reluctance to answer how many um i 
Good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know. The imposter syndrome, it's an, it's an interesting thing. I, <coughs> sorry, I myself don't, um, I, I say that I don't like saying how many for the simple reason that no matter what you say as an answer, um, there's always going to be someone who's going to disagree. As we saw in, in my presentation, um, opinions are so different and so diverse. So to try and give a, an answer that actually works, for me, I just say I've studied more than 50 languages in, in my life so far. And other languages I've looked at. I've obviously not studied all languages in the same, to the same level of depth, but I, th I feel it's safer than saying I speak X number of languages. I mean, I, I can safely say that I use a certain number of languages. Um, so at home, I speak five languages um, on a daily basis. I speak English, French, Macedonian, German, and Spanish. And then for work, I use a number of others. And in the street where I live, we, we, we use Turkish and Albanian as well. And I often use Greek and Bulgarian and Serbian. And so there are a number of languages that I just use, but um, I, I find the number and how many just, people try and count them for me. Um, I, I, I don't really mind. Um, if you say I speak one, I speak one. If you say I speak 159, I don't, but knock yourself out. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. No one's gonna give you a prize for speaking lots of languages. Um, why do you think it's nuanced? Uh, fine understanding of fluency uh, is not mainstream. I, I think that because people write their theses on what fluency means, people don't, um, people don't commonly agree. I mean, we saw when I put the question out there, you saw on, on my social media channels, people don't agree with, to an answer. People even change their minds. They, they go backwards and forwards, they flip flop, they have, someone will say you need to know every word in the language, even more than some monolinguals know in one language. It's just, um, it's impossible to, to say. Um, are there any languages you, um, you find hard? Okay, you find you know, just couldn't connect with. Um, okay, so I would say that for me personally, I've, I, I love all languages. I think that's just, uh, I've probably given right. Um, but I have, actually had the experience with Georgian where um, I did a semester of Georgian at the University of Malmo in Sweden online and um, I really enjoyed it. At the end of my studies I could say pretty much almost zero in Georgian um, and I studied a lot of the grammar, I studied a lot of words, a lot of vocabulary. Um, I, found it, I found it quite difficult to retain because of the consonant clusters and the plosives and I found the, the verbs quite difficult to memorize and to retain in my, in my active memory. Um, so I was reading texts and things and dialogues and yes, I could follow what was going on and I passed my, my exams and I passed the course, but um, at the end of the course, yeah, I don't, I, I just felt that it was going to be such a big investment of my time uh, to, to carry on and to take it to a high level. And it's a language that I'd never heard uh, in real life at that point in my life. I've never heard Georgian spoken except by my teacher at University Online. So yeah, that would be the only one uh, so far. And Armenian's been similar. I had a similar experience with Armenian. I've never really heard it, but I did, I did three levels of Armenian. Uh, um, the, uh, this university uh, college in Yerevan. Um, so let me see. The other one being from public conference gathering. I really stuck with you for years. Um, has been a talk. Oh wow, a talk that stuck with me for years. Um, that's a really good question. There have been quite a lot of people who have stuck in my who stay in my mind and, and in my memory from all of the events. Um, Honestly, for me, a real gem is Johan von der Wolle because he was kind of, he's just like a personal hero of mine. I was the one that found out about him and posted on the forum um, when I introduced him to the people in the, in the language community. And um, meeting him and hearing his talk in Reykjavik on Turkic languages, I was just blown away um, because he had so much information and it was just, it was fascinating for me to listen to. Uh, so possibly that <laughs> um, from a purely language point of view. Uh, there were a number of others that really struck a chord with me. Actually, there were there were some at the language event in Edinburgh that I helped put together um, just before um, the COVID pandemic broke. 
and we were celebrating the languages of the the the, um, the Isles. So looking at um, all the Celtic languages and Scots and Old English and you name it, all of the languages of the Isles. And um, there were some stories actually that came out of that about Scots and about uh, Gaelic that were really moving, like people having languages taken away from them, uh, people having their languages devalued. Uh, for me, indigenous language cultures, for example, indigenous languages that are often in those communities, some very sad, some very shocking, very surprising stories um, that always move me. And um, so, yeah, I think there are a number of those that really move me. And, and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm a big advocate of these languages. And also I, I like it when we can support um, people in, in these communities and, and at least if we're not if we're not able to do a huge amount, we can at least amplify their voices and uh, allow their voices to be heard by people who need to hear them. Um, do you think that increasingly uh, dominant uh, dominant position of English international language uh, is damaging for multilingualism? Um, good question. English. Clearly, it's my native language. It's my first language. I was brought up as a monolingual English speaker. And um, so, I mean, I, I love English. <laughs> um, I do also see it as um, a dominant and in invasive language, unfortunately. Um, it does tend to um, become a, a neutrally a new, politically neutral language for some strange reason in many countries, which I've never understood. Um, but also, I think that it does sometimes become uh, the de facto, the sort of default language. And I've often said to people, look, um, we can use another language if you want. Um, people have also commented to me that, you know, at the Polyglot Conference, I use English. And I use English because it's my native language. I mean, why wouldn't I use English? But the really weird thing is they'll do that knowing I speak another language they speak, but they'll do it in English. So if you want to break it, you have to be the person to break it. You're the person that has the power to not use English and to change that. So I always say to people, if you want to change it, change it. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't just say that it's there and it's a problem. You have to be positive. You have to be active. You have to be kind of a language warrior and, and, and really uh, be the force for change. Okay. Last question. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much for all of your uh, time and all of your questions. Really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much for listening to me. Do reach out to me on social media through Speaking Fluently, and I look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.